Carolyn, would we'll you say amen and go home? How about that? Thank you so much for that. We'll be hearing the word commitment and service a few times tonight, I'm sure. So let's sing a hymn of commitments. And Isaiah says, Then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. Let's stand as we sing. Lord, here am I. May that be the prayer of every heart here. Here am I. Send me. I pray that you will speak in this service, even though it is a special service dedicated in your honor because of this one who has given himself, his life, his all to you. And we ordain him to the ministry tonight. I pray that this service might be a witness to many. May someone come to know you because of our meeting here tonight. May your spirit have full control and free reign of our hearts. And may all of us leave here more committed, better able, more fitted to service as we leave this place tonight. Bless us, we pray, and make us a blessing. In the matchless name of Christ, we do pray. And all his people said together in agreement, amen and amen. Thank you and be seated. Let me welcome you tonight. It's good to see you in God's house. It's glad, good to have all of you here, especially those of you who visit with us. You're always welcome at Gillsburg. And it's a joy to see so many visitors with us tonight for this uh, special service. We're going to just go right straight through this program, and we have a lot to do in a short time, so we'll not take a lot of time with anything. But um, I don't think our candidate tonight, Brother Austin, needs much introduction, even though that's what's on the program here. We have a little biographical sketch inside your program about him. But all of you know Austin, and uh, Austin, there are a few that want to have things to say, so if you'll take care of me on that, I'll not let them speak, so I'll cover you on that, but um, especially some of your family members back here, but uh, that's a joke now, um, but Austin is going to come and uh, give to us his personal testimony at this time, so you help me welcome Austin and listen to him carefully as he speaks in these moments. I've already had three charges tonight. When I get well this today, when I got here this morning, Dalton told me not to go long. 
Kayla told me no jokes. And just a while ago, Mr. Dennis told me I needed to choose my words a little bit better. <laughs> so apparently, in the last seven, eight years, I've done a lot of stuff wrong. <laughs> before, we, uh, before we get into all about me, <laughs> I want to let you know, uh, I thank you for being here. In case I don't catch you after the service or you skip the reception, uh, I want to thank the deacons and staff and uh, family, friends, uh, the committee who was decorating for me Wednesday night. I was in there and they were saying, is Austin worth this while I was there? And Miss Lawanda was mumbling something under her breath. Miss Margaret said no. <laughs> but Gillsburg people are going to do it anyway. And I, uh, I want you to know I appreciate it. I have, uh, over the years, preached a couple of sermons that I want to kind of combine tonight. Uh, the first one. I entitled years ago, Just Say Yes, and it was about Mary and how Mary had plans. She was going to get married. Everything was in line. She was preparing, and then all of a sudden, she found out she was pregnant with the Savior of the world, with the Messiah, and she could have complained she could have said, no, not me. She could have ran down to the nearest Planned Parenthood. But she didn't. She just said yes. That's kind of how this started. In a grass parking lot out at Maxfield, which I'll get out there I'll get to in a little bit later. But that was the first sermon that I'm going to kind of combine tonight. The second one, just kind of as an intro, I preached about a puzzle piece. And the sermon that I preached it on was about why does bad things happen to good people? And kind of the whole idea was when something bad happens to us, all we see is this puzzle piece. You look at it, it just kind of looks light blue, purple. I have no idea what it is. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. But yet God, my Father's in heaven, and he's putting this piece in the puzzle. And he's taking a step back and he sees the whole picture. So just because my mind and your human mind cannot comprehend what this piece means to us while we're looking at it. I know God is on the throne. And I know he's in control of everything. And he's putting this piece down. And I tell you that to start because I just said yes and had no idea what I was saying yes to one night. And as I go through my testimony, I want you to see the pieces that at the time I had no idea what they meant, did not understand them, was scared to death of them. After I said yes, went home and wondered why I did that. And over the last seven, eight years, I've wondered on occasion what in the world I'm doing here. Okay, But I want you to see those pieces tonight as I go through this. I was uh, really don't have any uh, great uh, testimony that you'd want to write a book about. Um, I just have mine, and it's my book. And I was blessed uh, to have parents who raised me right, who were God-fearing, who had me here any time that they could get me here, raising three kids and running a dairy operation, because sometimes the heifers would get out, the baby calves wouldn't suck. The cow would get down. But they had me here as much as they could. I'm blessed to be born in that type of family. Also, just a few in my family. My grandfather, on my mom's side, was a deacon at his church. So we always prayed over the meal. At Christmas, my Aunt Amanda would always read the Christmas story. So I was, it was out there for me. I saw it. I never knew him, never got to meet him because he died before I was born. But everybody talks about my Uncle Woody 
and how he had perfect attendance in Sunday school here at Gillsburg for almost his whole life. Uh, so you see what type of family uh, that I came from, and I was blessed. Another person who had a huge influence was that woman. And she would, uh, Sunday nights, she would teach a class back there. She would pick me up from the house if Mama couldn't get me here. and had a huge impact on my life. I remember her class. I wasn't supposed to be in there. She taught the older kids, but nobody would really teach the younger kids, so she just took me. And I remember sitting in there, and Walter Jr. and them could pronounce some big words because she would make you read straight from the Bible. Now we don't even bring Bibles to church. But she'd make you read straight from the Bible, and Walter Jr. and Carl and all of them would pronounce those big words, and I was just this little eater in there, and I couldn't pronounce it. But boy, that class really had something uh, for me. It really changed my life. I remember Miss Martha McMillan taught the 5th and 6th grade Sunday school class down there on the end. And I remember after the Bible study, there was a globe in there. And she would get the globe out, and we'd spin it real fast, and we'd have our finger dragging across it. And wherever it stopped, that's where we were going to end up in the future. And I know that seems simple, <laughs> but I remember that. That was, so, that was one of my memories of Gillsburg Baptist Church. VBS Children's Choir with Mama and Miss Brenda, Lisa and Ken Adams. Y'all remember those productions we used to put on? Nothing's been done like that around here since. <laughs> Memorized. Mr. Dennis, I don't know what kind of function it was. I don't know if it was a kid function or a youth function, but I remember going down to y'all's little creek down Grange Hall Road uh, for some church event. And they had the guitar, and everybody was singing and stuff. And I just remember you giving me a hard time because I wouldn't sing. Little, it's the little things. It's the little things that I remember from being here at Gillsburg Baptist Church. And the reason I tell you all that is because I'm going to let you off the hook. Because I'm going to tell you, Gillsburg Baptist Church, you did what you were supposed to do for me. Your hands are clean. Amongst you, my family, and friends, God was there. God was always on my mind. And because y'all and everything that you've done over the years, I've come to know and love him. You did what you were supposed to do. And every now and then a church just needs to hear that. I was saved in my preteen years, officially, and was going to heaven, but I was scared to death to walk down here and tell you about it. Scared to death. I deal with a lot of youth who are scared to death. So I know all about it. I, during those years, unfortunately, none of us are perfect. During those years, our church was going through a little squabble. It's just the facts. And I used that as an excuse to justify not coming down here. Because I said, why in the world would I want to join the church like that? But really and truly, that was just an excuse. Because years later, after having Avery as my youth minister, and Brother Robbie Britt was here at the time, Brother Robbie was actually gone, and he let Grant Rainey fill in. Kind of like how Brother Vic lets me fill in. And Grant preached, and Avery was down front, and I was coming off knee surgery. I just had knee surgery, I think, in May. I had to uh, go on crutches for May, June, and July. Uh, at the end of July, I got off the crutches so I could go to state. So I was on my crutches. And all those years, because let me tell you, folks, if you're sitting there dealing with it and not wanting to come down here after you've been saved, the longer you wait the harder it gets. But the great thing about that Sunday was, on crutches, knee surgery, I got up, and it was the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. I wasn't scared. I had no anxiety. wasn't nervous. Just hopped up like I do now, came on down, and here was Avery. And Grant thought he had done something special. Okay? 
Brother Robbie came back and met with me a couple of days later at my house, and he was like, boy, Grant's fired up. He really thinks, you know. See? <laughs> Grant and I graduated high school together, uh, just to let you know. So you see how these pieces are falling into place. The summer of 2004, after I had graduated high school, is when I came down and made it public to Gillsburg Baptist Church, and I've been a member ever since, never moved my letter. I was baptized in the baptistry very carefully, coming off knee surgery, and uh, by Brother Robbie Britt. After I was baptized, I went straight to Mississippi State, straight to a four-year college. The first semester was a breeze. Easiest. I was like, what are these people so college? Come on, this is easy. Second semester, rock my world. Failed calculus and physics in the same semester. Sure did. I was an engineering major. That was stupid. And thankfully, thankful for academic forgiveness, Mississippi State would give you six hours of academic forgiveness. That was it. Well, guess how many hours I had failed? Six. And on the phone with Miss Ellen Jones and some emails back and forth with uh, Clay Campbell. Uh, luckily, I graduated from Mississippi State with a 3.25 GPA and got through there after changing my major to business. While we were at Mississippi State, my best friend was there, Brett McMillan, and I'm not going to lie to you, we did some things we shouldn't have. Uh, and I think, in hindsight, yeah, at first I regretted not coming down here as soon as I was saved and joining the church. But kind of looking back on it now, I'm very thankful that I came down in 2004, right before I went to college. Because I think if I wouldn't have done that, it would have been harder to pull me out of that world that I was living in in college, if that makes any sense. And because I was fresh coming off of that, I could come back. I could come back easier. Um, while we were at Mississippi State, uh, we, we still went to church. I went to First Baptist Church of Starkville. Uh, most of my time up there, Brother Chip Stevens was the pastor. He is now pastor at First Baptist Church Jackson, but he was the pastor there when I went. We went to another church one time. Excuse me, Lindy, but we went because Brent was chasing a girl. I can't remember what, but at least we were in church, okay? After uh, Mississippi State... Well, actually, while I was still in Starville and still living in the Purple House uh, there in Starville, that's what we called it, um, I decided to read the Bible from the front cover to the back cover. And that was the first time I ever did it. And I actually, during that semester, I read the Old Testament once, the New Testament twice, and Psalms twice. And since then, I've done it three other times, uh, reading the Bible. So I think that was a turning point. When I was a senior at Mississippi State, all my friends hated me because I didn't want to do anything with them anymore. I kind of just locked myself up in my room because I was done with the four-year college. Uh, I was ready to graduate and get out of there, uh, and that's what I did. And I left Mississippi State, and I went to Mississippi College. And for any of you out there who have, um, you know, academic support or scholarships or maybe you can just afford it, uh, I thought Mississippi College was great. I thought it was one of the greatest things that happened to me. So if you're looking for a college, I would highly recommend Mississippi College. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Mississippi College, uh, you have a chapel every morning uh, that you go to as a student. Uh, I just, the teachers, uh, you know, Baptists, Christians, I just really thought Mississippi College was great. Uh, what you may not know is while I was at Mississippi College, I lived in the garage apartment of Dr. Frank Pollard. I call it Pollardville. Dr. Frank Pollard was the pastor of First Baptist Church of Jackson for many years. I believe he was the president of the Mississippi Baptist at one time. I think he ran for president of the Southern Baptist but got beat. But you can Google him uh, today and see some of his sermons on YouTube. Uh, so that's one of those puzzle pieces, right? Had no idea. I just lived with some old dude. He had Parkinson's and actually died while I was there, okay? But it's one of those puzzle pieces. 
And I remember Miss Jane Pollard, I remember when the, uh, they came back, they had the funeral there at First Baptist Jackson. The family came in. Some of their stuff uh, was in my apartment, so I let them in. But I just think that's interesting. One of those puzzle pieces, as I look back, that at the time made no sense to me whatsoever. Uh, but now that I look back, uh, to think about the influence uh, that carried on. Finished uh, Mississippi College with a 3.75 GPA. Did a lot better there than I did at State. And started my career in Ridgeland. I started, I uh, lived uh, close to, uh, lived on Lake Harbor Drive, uh, close to the reservoir there, and started my career at Ridgeland. Uh, while I was at Ridgeland, I met this guy who worked with me, Michael Ward. Michael was a credit analyst with me. His father was a pastor. Michael was one of my best friends, really my only friend up there, because I didn't know anybody. And uh, Michael got married. I went to his wedding. And uh, that's just one of those pieces. About a year into my stint at First South in Ridgeland, uh, the president, John Bernard, came to me. And he said, I want to move you to Macomb. Will you go? No way. No, ain't happening. I'll take a pay cut. I ain't going. Staying here. Because at that time, I was like, I got I escaped from Gillsburg. I got out of Gillsburg. Okay? About six months later, he called me back into the conference room. And he said, you're going to Macomb. You're going to Macomb to take Steve Cawthorn's place, if any of y'all know Steve Cawthorn. So packed my stuff, came to Macomb, bought a house. I worked there in Macomb. And while I was there, uh, it was just easier to come to church here because I needed Mama to fix me some food for lunch. So I would drive down. I would be here for the 11 o'clock service. I would sit in the back. I wouldn't say anything to anybody. When Brother Vic was done, I was first one out the door and did that for a while. Then, as some time passed, I joined Brad's uh, Sunday school class, even though I was like the youngest dude in there. But I joined his Sunday school class and started coming to that Sunday school class every Sunday morning at 10. And would come in here at 11 and uh, got more comfortable. Uh, then all of a sudden, out the blue, I have no idea why you did it, but Brother Vic started asking me to uh, do the invocation prayer at the beginning of the service. Uh, so I was, the first time he asked me, I was nervous. I was writing stuff out at home, had my notes with me. I was like, I wonder if you're supposed to have notes when you pray or not. I didn't know what the rules were uh, and got up here and did it, did it a couple other times. And while I was sitting back there, about where Carly is right now, uh, right, and about where Mr. Rodney is. He turned around and said that he had run into Ray Campbell and he had signed us up to play softball. And I was like, who's going to play? Well, me, you, Ansley, Jeffrey, and Tyler. I said, oh, oh. And that's what we did. That's what got me at Maxfield because Mr. Rodney invited me. Or he kind of just told me I needed to be there. And we played. And we didn't have enough Gillsburg players, so we had to borrow from other churches to make it work. Uh, Mr. Rodney would pitch. I would play short. Due to our size, we had the middle of the infield covered. Um, and had a good time doing that. About the end of that summer, if I remember correctly, I don't even know how they got there or why they got there. Maybe you recruited them. But the youth showed up. Matter of fact, I think they showed up for the last game that summer. And it was tons of them. I didn't even get to play. It was so many of them. And they came, and uh, we were sitting in the bleachers before the game, waiting on the game and before us to get over. And uh, Madeline, Caitlin, and Lauren were sitting in the bleachers talking. And I just turned around and said something to them. We started a conversation. And that was when uh, the famous line, Brad, when they said, wait, you go to Gillsburg? I was like, yeah, I'm on y'all's team tonight. They didn't even know I came to church here. Well, uh, <laughs> we played, and as you know, I was an athlete, was an athlete, <laughs> and had a good time, loved competition. Uh, we formed a relationship. We uh, had nicknames, uh, this and that, had a great time. When they got done with that game, they were like, are we, we going to play again next week? We're going to play again next week? I was like, no, nah, this thing's over. Y'all waited till the last week. 
Um, then kind of, uh, I want to say it was the next summer when they started coming a lot um, and had that relationship. Uh, I didn't know what it was or what it was becoming, uh, but obviously uh, at least Dalton saw it because in the grass parking lot of Maxfield one night after a game, he said, uh, you don't, you know, just think about this, pray about it. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he kind of came to me like, I'm thinking about this, but I'm not sure you're it, but I'm thinking about this, you know. He's like, have you thought about being youth minister? And I can't remember exactly what I said to him then, uh, but I can tell you, uh, as soon as he asked me, I said yes in my head. But he wouldn't take my answer. He just kept saying, go, go think about it, go pray about it. I think because he was worried I was going to tell him no. And so that's kind of how we started the conversation. And uh, I finally, uh, maybe it was the next week at Maxfield, or maybe it was a text message, I can't remember exactly, I told him yes. I, I, was, I think I was ready. I think I could do that. I had big plans uh, for what I thought uh, we could do uh, here at Gillsburg. And he said, okay, well, let's meet with the youth committee on this day at this time. Well, I got off work. And I drove all the way down here from Brookhaven, and I parked in the parking spot right there. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited, and the youth committee did not show up. So I stayed an hour, didn't have any cell service here, decided I would just drive back to Macomb. Figured that was the answer I needed. <laughs> Get back. And I think Dalton texts me, he's like, I totally forgot, and I didn't tell the youth, other youth committee members, we forgot. Can we do this Sunday after church? <laughs> so we came back the next Sunday after church, met with the youth committee, and that's kind of where it all took off. And uh, that uh, these kids we got now, they're special to me, don't get me wrong. But that first group, whew. We went through some stuff. <laughs> they, are, uh, they are special. And uh, some of the best years of my life. And if it wasn't for uh, the likes of Bailey Hughes, who would make me talk to the lifeguard at Blue Bayou, because he'd be like, hey, this is my daddy. He's single. You want to talk to him? And I was forced into talking to the lifeguards at Blue Bayou. Uh, and it helped me tremendously socially. Because if you knew me before then, I was a man of very few words. And now all of you want me to be a man of few words. It's funny how that, how that happens. But I tell you all this because if I wouldn't have said yes, to Dalton in the grass parking lot of Maxfield. I wouldn't have improved socially. Um, probably wouldn't be as good as a banker as I am today without that experience. Probably would have never gotten married without that experience. And these are the puzzle pieces that I'm telling you about that make no sense why I had to talk to that lifeguard but when you look back on it, it kind of makes some sense. Became youth minister of Gillsburg Baptist Church. Had no idea what I was doing, but I had a plan, and I was sticking to it, uh, no matter what anybody thought. And uh, we were very fortunate. God blessed us in many ways uh, with a lot of good events, uh, a lot of good kids, um, great attendance, and uh, a lot of them came to know the Lord baptized a few of them, some of them in Brushy Creek in Gloucester, baptized case in here. Um, things just kind of took off. God started working. And the first time I was ever asked to speak somewhere, those crazy youth I was telling you about, they obviously had the majority of the senior class at ASC because they voted me to speak at their bachelor art. 
first time I'd ever spoke in front of anyone. ASC Baccalaureate. And all I could remember was Avery Dixon was my youth minister, and he spoke at my baccalaureate. And Coach Campbell would always, he would hound him, Avery, you have to wear a coat, you have to wear shoes. Coach Campbell was seriously worried about how Avery was going to appear. And here I am, the first time I've ever speak to anyone about the Bible, about God, I, I was voted to speak at the ASC baccalaureate. Well, here's where the pieces really start falling. In the attendance of that baccalaureate, I still remember the joke I told that night. I can't tell you here. Uh, in, the, in attendance at that baccalaureate that year was my future father-in-law, my future wife, and my future sister-in-law was in the class. And I spoke there at that baccalaureate at ASC. Well, also in attendance was the youth minister at a sister church in our county um, who was either, like Brother Tommy would say, extremely desperate or must have been impressed because he called me and asked me to preach a youth camp. And it was a four or five day youth camp and they put me in an RV, put me across the lake from the kids in an RV and said, you're going to stay here four days and you're going to preach two sermons each day. And I stayed in that RV with the music guy that was there, Steve-O. Uh, just spoiler alert, Steve-O is coming back for one of our Monday nights in July. Uh, I've asked him and he'll be here. Uh, Steve-O and I spent that week in that RV. You want to know whose RV it was? Lee Ryder's parents. Lee used to lead music here. spoke at that youth camp uh, was unbelievable. It was uh, just a, I just can't say enough good things about it. I still have the video of it. And, uh, and I said when I left there, I'm going to have that for Gillsburg. And a few years later, guess where we went? To Brushy Creek. And we did the same exact thing that we did there. And Steve-O did the music there uh, for our youth uh, at Gillsburg, all because of the ASC Bachelor Art. Since then, over the years, uh, I've been asked to to fill in pulpit supply at some churches. Uh, been asked to do revivals. Um, one of my more recent revivals, I did with Lee Ryder. Lee led the music, and I preached, and we we got to cutting up afterwards about all Gillsburg stories. And Lee was asking me, all you Gillsburg people, if y'all are still around, what you were doing. Uh, but that's kind of cool that Lee was here, led music. Um, my first youth camp, I stayed in his parents' RV. And then here just a few years ago, I was doing a revival uh, with Lee. And the boy can still sing, uh, for those of you that remember him. And afterwards, he came up to me and he goes, Austin, I'll just be honest with you. When I was at Gillsburg, Never in my life did I think you would be one to get up there and preach like that. And I said, well, Lee, I don't know if that's a compliment or not, but I'll take it. Uh, so I've been able to, to go around to a lot of churches, uh, Morris Hill, Robinson, uh, Unity, Greensburg, Silver Creek, Thompson, uh, over the years, and, and see a lot of different churches and meet a lot of people and see how they do things. And I think it's good uh, to get out and experience that every now and then. Uh, because we all need to, to see new things and a new way of doing things and a new way of reaching people. Um, and we, I really think we, we don't do a very good job of this, but uh, I believe all our churches around here should join forces. I think we should join forces and lock arms to bring people to Jesus Christ. And I don't think we're doing a good enough job. I think we just stay in our little section here, and I don't think we do a, a good enough job. And I think we should combine and do some things. And uh, right before COVID, we had that back-to-school night. This place was packed with other churches. It's possible. It's just a matter of somebody doing it. And uh, I just think we need to do that. And, and uh, Kayla and I will be gone next week. Don't freak out. I'm not going anywhere. It's our anniversary. And guess where we're going? To someone else's church to see what they do and how they do things.
That's where we're going. Because we can't go long because my kids won't sleep at my parents' house. So just one night for us. Now I want to get to the serious stuff and, and I'll get us out of here. I, uh, as I told the guys in the back, the moment I realized that I was supposed to preach was the moment that I tried to quit and he wouldn't let me. And my biggest fear was him calling me to do something and me and not answer. And uh, so that's why we're here tonight. That's why we're here. If it wouldn't have been for Rodney Dykes asking me to play softball, Dalton asking me to be youth minister, Brother Vic asking me to preach, um, the youth asking me to do the baccalaureate art. Um, long story short, for those of you who don't know, I ended up marrying Kayla, and Kayla worked for Dr. Vic. And Miss Sherry would fix us food to eat, and like, hey, y'all go, go get to know each other and eat this chicken salad. Gained like 20 pounds during that. So you see those puzzle pieces? I had no idea at the time what I was doing, whether it was right or wrong. Didn't understand it. But now, the little bit that God has let me see, because I know I can't see the full picture yet, but the little bit of what God has let me see, it's all kind of fallen into place. And I want you to know tonight, before I leave here, that I believe the Word of God was inspired, breathed, and written by being God, interwoven with history to point us to a person, Jesus Christ. And the only thing I can promise you tonight, as long as I can do it, I will do everything in my power to stay true to the word of God. I believe that Jesus Christ came to earth, was born of a virgin, and lived a sinless and perfect life to fulfill the law. Because you and I, there was no way we could keep the law because we weren't perfect. He was perfect and sinless and fulfilled the law for us and died on the cross to pay the price for my sins so that I wouldn't have to. And I believe he was dead. And they placed him in that tomb. And on the third day, he rose to defeat death so that you and I, if we follow him and place our faith in him, we don't have a thing to worry about because even though our physical body may die here, we will live forever. And I believe he ascended into heaven and he's at the right hand of the Father right now preparing a place for me and you. And I know the world seems crazy right now. And the country seems crazy. And you're wondering, why in the world is all this happening? Why is he allowing this to happen? And I'm telling you, God is still on the throne and he is still in charge and it's our job to tell people about Jesus Christ. And then I believe the hope that we have. And I was telling the guys uh, earlier that a lot of my youth, when we start talking about this, they get anxious or scared or, or just uncomfortable with it. But I believe he's coming back. And I'm not scared about it. I'm not anxious about it. I'm not fearful about it. I'm hopeful for it that he's coming back. And that's what I believe. And that's what I will continue to preach. And I'll promise you, every one of you, I don't have all the answers. I've made a lot of mistakes already. I was going through some of my old sermons this past week and was <laughs> shook my head on a couple things. I was like, ah. Because I'm continuing to learn, I'm continuing to study, and I hopefully I will get better with time and with age. But I promise you, I will give my absolute 125% effort to share the word of Jesus Christ 
with everybody I come in contact with and to serve you in Gillsburg by ministering and caring for the people. A lot of people have been freaking out and been asking me, are you leaving? Like, is this your ticket out of here? I don't know what God has in store for me. I don't know what the next piece is. But I can tell you, as of tonight, 5.43, I plan on being here Wednesday night to teach your youth. If the Lord calls me somewhere next week, we'll deal with that then. But my plan right now is to serve Gillsburg Baptist Church, the deacons, Brother Vic, and you to the best of my ability. Real quick, like, Brother Vic touched on this this morning. And I hadn't talked to him, and he, he doesn't know. But the youth and I studied this Wednesday night. And I think it would, I would be reminisced to leave here or get down from here for an ordination of a pastor if I don't share this with you, because this is kind of my job. I asked the youth three questions Wednesday night. And then I'm going to ask you. And then I'm going to tell you where to find the answers. And I want you to go home and find it. First, I'm going to tell you the questions. I want you to answer them to yourself in your head. Then I want you to go to this spot in the Bible and see if you got them right. If you did, great. If you didn't, I would love to talk to you. Brother Vic would love to talk to you. Brother Alton would love to talk to you. Make sure you can answer these three questions. The first one, how did you get here on earth? How did you get here? The second one, what are you doing here? And the third one, how are you going to leave here? How did you get here? What are you doing here? And how are you going to leave here? If you got your pen and paper, I encourage you to go to Acts, Acts 17, Acts chapter 17, and read verses 24 through 31. Acts 17, verses 24 through 31. And those answers should be there for you. I encourage anyone whether it's you're thinking about teaching a Sunday school class, whether you're thinking about uh, taking over RAs or uh, teaching a class, we have the sign-up sheet for VBS, whatever it may be, if you're thinking about that right now, I hope uh, that you'll take uh, the two ideas tonight, just say yes, and that puzzle piece that you may not understand at this time, it'll fit into that grand picture that God is looking at. I hope that you'll take that to heart. Thank you again for being here, and I'll turn it over to Brother Walter. Thank you, Austin. Does anybody have any uh, doubts we're making the right decision tonight? The uh, recommend we had... At 4 o'clock, we met as a council, a recommendation from the Ordinance Council, convened this afternoon at 4 o'clock by the authority of the Gillsburg Baptist Church. An ordination council was assembled at the church for the purpose of examining Austin, Bean, Austin Lee Bean prior to his ordination to the gospel ministry. After prayer, testimony, and questioning of the candidate, the council recommends that Austin Lee Bean be ordained as a minister of the gospel on the 25th day of April, 2021, at Gillsburg Baptist Church, Gillsburg, Mississippi. Thank you. All right, I made it through the hardest part of that. I got up the steps. That's more than we can say for our president. <laughs> Equal time, Dr. Walsh. 
or do we chalk it up for youthful exuberance? <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you. I learned a few things about you that I didn't even know. It's always a joy to stand in this pulpit before Gillsburg Baptist Church, have fond, fond memories, and appreciate the work that Gillsburg does in the association and all the part that you had to play in this young man's life. I appreciate what Brother Austin had to say. For these many years since I've been your director of missions, I've tried to pull things together and point us in the same direction. That's part of my job. In fact, that's probably the biggest part of my job, promote missions and to encourage the churches and, and do the things that we need to do because we can't do it all by ourselves. You can reach this little community, perhaps so, but not without the help of neighboring churches round about putting their input into the lives of the people they have influence over. So I want to share with you today, I have my notes written down on two little sticky notes. That doesn't mean a thing. My daughter said I could preach for an hour without any notes. So uh, this is just a guide to help me touch upon a couple of points that I want to share with you. It's my challenge today to charge the church. And I believe that's a very vital part of any ordination service, whether it's for a minister or a deacon, a missionary, whomever it might be that we're having a part in a service like this. And as I charge the church today, I want us to understand that we are the body of Christ in the world today. We are his arms, his hands, his feet, his mind, his eyes. We are Jesus in the flesh. The spirit of the Lord is in charge. Don't get me wrong. And I understand the power and might of God, but I also understand the power and might that the church is not stepping up to wield. The church has sat idly by and allowed things to happen in our land that ought not to have happened. For years, I'm not talking about the last election, I'm not talking about the last few years, I'm talking about the last couple of generations. We've sat idly by, we've enjoyed our progress, and we've enjoyed our materialism, and we've enjoyed our freedoms. And now, we're reaping. Sow to the wind and reap the whirlwind, the old saying goes. And I believe that's what's happened in the life of our churches today. So, Gillsburg Baptist Church, I charge you to be the church. I get my basis from a scripture passage that's not perhaps used in ordination services much. And I don't like to be uh, different or unique necessarily, but it spoke to, spoke to me. And I want to speak to you concerning this. Found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. These words are said, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. The church at Corinth was uh, experiencing some difficulties and had to have a, a, a letter written to them from the hand of God. And that's, if we believe this is God inspired, then we believe the letter Paul wrote was written by God through his hand to the church at Corinth. And that's what he says. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of us. You and I are instruments in the hand of God. You as a church, we as church people, we are God's work in the world today. It says we have this treasure in earth and vessels. It means that we're not perfect. We're susceptible to all the temptations and trials of the world. You're not ordaining a perfect man to live in a troubled world and take care of all the problems. All of us are earthen vessels. Earthen vessels are susceptible to cracks and leaks and breakage. Sometimes they're very delicate. Sometimes they stand up under severe pressure, but most of the time they're very limited in their usefulness. Earthen vessels. We're not made out of indestructible materials. We're not made out of something that is going to be forever. We're 
human beings. Nevertheless, God has instructed us as the church that we're to do certain things in this world. We're setting aside what we pray and plan and hope to be a leader in God's kingdom. All the while hoping and praying and trusting that he'll stay right here in this congregation. And he will as long as God wills in his life. And we're grateful that we're not in charge. Because God knows what we need before we know what we need. So I'm charging this church, Gillsburg Baptist Church, to pray. Pray as you have been praying that God would place his hand upon men and women and boys and girls in your congregation. Pray that as you have been praying, God would touch young people and call them into places of responsibility within the church. And one of the benefits and blessings of staying in a place a long time is watching people grow. I served for 17 years in the pastorate where I served before I came here. And December of this year will be 25 years. 17 years I watched little boys that gave us fits in Bible school and RAs when I took them camping by myself, 12 of them. We'd go camping. Parents were very vulnerable in that day and time. And I was very gullible. But I took those boys and, and we developed memories and, and, and I watched them grow. And, and, and a lot of those boys are now deacons. And very active in their churches that they're serving in. I watched young ladies become women and, and have families. Uh, a while back I was asked to go and preach to the funeral of a 98 year old gentleman that was in the church that I pastored. And, and there were these kids coming in and, and introducing me to their children and it was it was weird because it was like me going back 40 years and being introduced to them again in their teenage years their daughters and their sons reminded me so much of them Austin you'll have that in the future as you look back upon your ministry you'll see faces that that, that you used to know, but from somehow, strangely, they're still 15. No, they're not. Their parents are the ones you used to know, and they look just like them. And, and, and it, it's, it's good to have those experiences. So pray. As you've prayed for him, continue to pray for him. Pray. Pray for one another. Expect, expect good things to happen. I know you always do that in church, or we try as pastors to get our churches to be very, very optimistic, and we pray that good things are going to happen, and we expect good things to happen, and we plan for good things to happen. There are lots of meetings that take place behind the scenes. There are folks meeting right now planning vacation Bible school. There are folks that are meeting planning revivals and planning the Wednesday and Monday nights in, in July. And there are lots of activities that go on behind the scenes. But in those meetings, I can assure you, I've been in a lot of them. The expectations are there. I expect to see great things happen in Austin's life. And if you expect to see great things happen in his life, then you need to do something else. You need to equip him. You need to give him the tools. You need to give him the compliments. You know, every good dog loves an attaboy and a pat on the head. I got a little dog, bless her heart. She spends most of her life at the end of a 20-foot chain because she won't stay put. I've tried to turn her loose, and two or three miles later down the road, I finally caught up with her and have to bring her back. And I say, you'll never learn your lesson with you. She, she's a digger and a runner. And if you've had one of those, you know the only solution is to just limit their activity. So I do. She loves to see me come, and, 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 you know, she forgives me every time. She don't hold no grudges. She's not mad at me. Uh -huh. She's not Baptist either. <laughs> Might add that. And due to her limitations, she has a little area that I've tried to make as comfortable as can be. She's the only dog in the country that has her own concrete slab. She's the only dog in the country that has a living room and a dining room. I have her little dog food dish in her little house, and she lets me know when it gets low, and she enjoys herself. But she, when she sees me coming, she wants a treat. I've kind of developed that in her. 
But I have to, I make her learn it. She has to sit down. She has to do a couple little things. And I don't even have to tell her now. She knows the drill. So she, as soon as she's coming, she, she lets me know. She's, I'm ready for my treat. I'm ready for my treat. And she goes and sits down by her house on that little concrete slab and waits for me to give her a treat. Well, I give her a little piece of this or a little, little, a little bit of that. But you know really what she really wants from me? It's for me to scratch her behind the ear. I get better response than I do from a dog biscuit or a little piece of sausage. She just wants attention. We're all like that. Austin's like that. You're like that. Your pastor's like that. We like to have that recognition. Expect things from him. Equip, provide for him. God's, God wants to bless us. All throughout the word, God wants to bless us. God wants to bless us because we are his children and he wants to bless us. So, I encourage you to be faithful as you pray, as you expect, as you equip. I pray that you would be faithful. And when the Lord comes again, and yes, he is coming again. No one knows when. Jesus said, I know not the hour, so I've not wasted one moment of my study time trying to figure it out. If Jesus didn't know, you ain't going to know, and I'm not going to know. And so we just need to look for it. And whenever he comes, it's going to be great. And we're going to have a grand old time in the eternity that he has prepared for us after our life here on earth. Be the church. I don't have to tell you to do that because you're already doing that. But I'm just encouraging you today to be the church and to take care of this young man in whatever area God leads he and his family to be a part of in the future. Thank you for allowing me to do so. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care And it who knows where On they go through pride silent cries only Jesus hears people need the Lord people need the Lord at the end of broken He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize? People need. Take his life 
to a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love, a horse can feel all the green. They must hear the words of life Only we can share People need the Lord People need the Lord At the end He's the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that we must be? all God's people said. Thank you, Brother Doug, for sharing that wonderful message and song with us. Well, it's always difficult to know how much time to plan for something such as this, and um, Austin, I promise you, I had no idea about what anybody was going to say tonight, so I thought in, in my charge to you, I'd have to be like, uh, you, you already see, You've got pieces to the puzzle. Brother Alton's been talking about memories of 50 years of ministry. I'm not quite that long, but I'm not too far behind you. And, and you'll find that you do start picking those up. I thought I needed to share one little kernel with you, and I promise you this was on my notes. It's been on there for weeks and weeks. Early in my ministry life, uh, one morning uh, at this church where I was serving, uh, a couple of the elder deacons cornered me. And um, they said, we want you to understand this very clearly. They said, our service starts at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and we are done at 12. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, that wasn't too hard for me to understand, I, you know. I didn't go to Mississippi State, but I could get that. <clears throat> but that wasn't the end of it. One of them, whom Brother Alton would know if I would call his name and won't, then said to me, you need to remember, we're paying you by the job and not by the hour. <laughs> That's my nearly 50 years worth of ministry experience there in a sentence. The book of Ezekiel gives to us a brief verse that I want to share with you for a few minutes tonight, the 22nd chapter of the book of Ezekiel. I just want to summarize some of these verses because reading them is somewhat tedious and we would all be depressed by the time we got to the end of it. So let me tell you in, in, in a few words what the 22nd chapter of the book of Ezekiel has to say. 
These were difficult days for the time, the life of Israel. In this particular chapter, this is what was, was going on in Ezekiel chapter 22. It was a time of spiritual drought. That may be worse than physical drought. As bad as physical drought is, spiritual drought may even be worse. But the scripture says that in this particular day and time, uh, there was conspiracy. There was extortion. There was theft. There was robbery. There was murder and violence of all sorts. Have you heard enough yet? There was profanity in every way. God's name was profaned. Everything that God called holy, they profaned. This was God's people that were doing that. His pulpit was profaned. His name and his word. Everything that God called good, they called evil. They were oppressing. They were exploiting. They were destroying the lives of people, the scripture says. And then, as you think about that, and you think about the parallels to our days, I come to verse 30, which I must read to you from Ezekiel 22. The word of God says, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so that I might not destroy it. But I found no one. I searched for a man who would stand in the gap and repair the wall. What, what is interesting to me as I read that paragraph in Ezekiel 22 is that God was even involved there. Why in the world would he want to be in the midst of such a mess as that spiritual drought was? Murder and violence and oppression and hatred and, and robbery and theft and all the other things that it talks about. Why in the world was God even messing with them? Why is he even still fooling with our nation today? He's searching man a man that's all he was looking for just one and he couldn't find even one isn't it interesting that he would even look e even though it, we, we must with, with this indictment today many of those same things at play in our world, in our nation. I, I want to tell you, and, and I'm like you, I believe this word, cover to cover in the maps and everything. I believe he's still at work. I believe he's still looking. I believe he's still searching. I believe he's still looking for people, men and women, and happily today, he will find and take even one, Austin, who is willing to answer his call as you have done. I may be a little more careful about who I ask to do the invocation here. I don't know. The, the pieces, as you can see them now, are fascinating, are they not? And God is still working. So, as I suggest some things to you quickly, what, what does he want from you? What is he looking for? What can he put in the wall to stand in the gap to, to make up the hedge there? I think, I think he needs a man with a good head. And I'm not talking about your looks. Kayla thinks you look good. Your mama thinks you look good. Nice hair. But Austin, you got to have a good head, and you do. You think right. You got a lot of sense, and you've been trained well, and you know how to use your common sense. So use your abilities and your skills 
that which God has gifted you with in a natural way and that which has benefited you in a larger way from your training and use it. Use your good head for the Lord and his church all the days of your life. Secondly, he's looking for a man with a kind heart. The scripture says kind, tender, generous, compassionate, forgiving, even, even as God in Christ has, has forgiven you and me. That's what he's looking for. That's what he needs to make up the, the gap there. Be ready with that word of encouragement to many. Continue to preach and teach the truth in love. With that kind of heart, God will use your kind heart. But he, he also wants you to have a strong hand. A strong hand. You may have to offer a hand up to somebody. You may have to offer a hand out to somebody. Do you know that the word leader is mentioned six times in the Bible and the word servant is mentioned 900? There's a word there for us as we charge you tonight. A good head, a kind heart, a strong hand, and a deepening hunger. And this is where I can share a personal testimony. I have seen in Austin over these years that we've worked together, and I told the council earlier tonight, I have never once asked him to do not one single thing that he did not do, not one. Everything from the most menial task to standing in this pulpit and preaching. He has done and carried out the task. But I have seen in him a deepening hunger for God's word. I have seen him uh, develop and grow in his study, in his word, and in his service, and all of that, because that is exactly what God has called him to do. And fifthly, Austin, you've got to have personal health. Personal health. And I share that with you because of my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. At a young age, my maternal grandmother had a stroke. As a very young woman, she had two children, and, and she had a stroke that left her partially paralyzed on one side, so she was never really able to, to do a whole lot. She wasn't able to function like a lot of grandmothers, never owned a car, never drove, any of those things like that. But she used to tell me, even... As a teenager, I lived with her as an older teenager for a while. But one of her great phrases to me, and it just rolled off of me like water off a duck's back. And she used to tell me, she'd say, watch your health. And that was all she'd say. And I'd laugh at her and blow it off and go on, and she'd come right back. Watch your health. You better listen to me. Watch your health. And you know, the longer I've lived, the more I figured out how much sense that lady had. Because without it, there's not a whole lot you can do in a lot of cases. It'll limit your ability. It'll limit your ministry. And God doesn't want that. And nobody else is going to take care of you like you will. So you do what my grandmother said to me. You watch your health because you need it in the service of the King of Kings. And lastly, and this is the, the one that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt has already been completed and taken care of. You need a perfect helpmate. <laughs> and you have that in Kayla. Allow her to be part of your ministry. God has blessed you of that, I am sure. And she will continue to compliment you and stand beside you and strengthen you in every way. God said, I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me. A man with a good head, a kind heart, a strong hand, a deepening hunger with personal health and a perfect helpmate. And so, Austin, I charge you as we ordain you tonight, use these things that God has gifted you with. And finally... I charge you to, to live in such a way that those who know you but who don't know God will come to know God because they know you. 
Godspeed. And many blessings, my brother. But now at this time, it is our wonderful privilege to lay hands on Brother Austin with Kayla standing by his side. So Brother Walter, if you will come and prepare this spot. Gentlemen, I'm going to ask all of the ordained men in our group tonight, if you're an ordained individual, you're welcome to come and lay hands on Brother Austin and say a word of encouragement and blessing uh, to him. Kayla, if you'd come and stand on this side over here by him, is that okay? Would that work for you? Okay. Gentlemen, if you will stand at this time, all of you who are ordained will come. I want to ask you to come over on this side. And let's start from over here. Brother Bucky, are you going to be able to come and participate? Come on, Brother Bucky. It's Austin's grandfather. Brother Bucky, would you lead the way? Would you be first? Come on. Come on right here. I'm going to let you start right here. I'm going to let you be number one. How about that? You go first.
pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this service. Thank you for Austin and Kayla. And thank you for Austin answering the call to follow your will in his life to service for you. Thank you for what they mean to this church and each individual here, uh, both Austin and Kayla. Thank you for their family and thank you for all they've done here so far and I, I look forward to see how you're going to use them in the future wherever you may lead them. Uh, be with us as fellow Christians and uh, friends and family that we will uh, help them any way we can. Give Austin the strength to follow your word. Give him the wisdom to uh, hear your word from you and follow your lead wherever you may have him go, whatever you may have him do. I pray that he will listen and follow through with that task. Be with us as we go forth from here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Walter Carpenter will come down. He's the chairman of our deacons this year, and I think he has a presentation to make. Also, I might come on up here. Also, I have the honor and privilege of presenting you with your certificate of uh, ordination. We, the undersigned, upon the recommendation and request of the ordination council convened by Gillsburg Baptist Church, which had full sufficient opportunity for judging the God given gifts. Christian experience, call to the ministry, and views of Bible doctrine hereby certify that Austin Lee Bean was solemnly and publicly set apart and ordained to the work of the gospel ministry by authority and order of the Baptist, Gillsburg Baptist Church on the 25th day of April 2021, signed by Dr. Victor Walsh and myself. So if you frame this, my signature will haunt you the rest of your life. <laughs> We also have we also have a card that was signed by all the members of the council. Something you can keep in, and remember us by, or, or think no bad thoughts about, about whatever. We also have a gift in here for you and Kayla. For you and Kayla. You and Kayla. <laughs> all right. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for your kindness and your patience and for being here tonight. Stand with me. We have a little fellowship time prepared uh, over in our fellowship hall, which go through these two doors. Uh, right straight out goes into one single hall right directly behind me. So just follow the crowd out that way. We hope you'll come over and wish Austin and Kayla the best and congratulate them and say a word of encouragement to both of them. So please do that and uh, get over that way quickly, and we'll try to get them on out of here there. The press is here, and I know she's got to take a few pictures, so uh, we'll have to wait on her for just a minute there. Let's be dismissed with prayer. Thank you again for your encouragement to them for being here tonight. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of this service and for what we have done. We pray your richest blessings upon Austin and Kayla. And I pray that you might continue to lead and direct and guide them so clearly that they have no doubt about what you want them to do. And I pray uh, that they might follow your leading. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And you're going out and you're coming in and you're lying down and you're rising up. And you're laboring and you're leisure. And may he give to you most of all that peace which passes all understanding, which will guard your hearts and minds by Christ Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. And the people of God all said together in agreement, amen and amen. Thank you, good night, and God bless you.